In this podcast, I am going to be sharing uh, Brandon's responses to some of the commentary from my uh, live chats that took place in December 2019 when I first began sharing his letters on my channel. Uh, what I did was I copied and pasted uh, portions of the chat log into a Word document and I printed them out and included it with my letters. And I thought it would be really interesting for him. I thought it was actually kind of crucial for him to see what people were saying. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult for him to feel that he has a voice on the outside. And in this way, um, I was voicing what he had to say and you guys all had something to say about what he said and now I have the return response. So it's kind of cool. Um, even though he can't get online and see what, what you all have to say and what you're thinking, um, I'm able to, it's weird, it's, it's kind of like I'm a conduit. I'm able to facilitate the possibility for that, for there to be a discussion. So what I'm going to do is read um, his comments, um, particularly the ones that are more on the abrasive side and um, are kind of uh, pointing a finger at him and... I think it I think it's really great to have his perspective on those particular kinds of accusations. Um I will explain why in this podcast and in the next one I'm going to do after this. I started this one like 8 times already, so I'm even if it's not perfect, I'm going to continue. Um There were two things I just wanted to mention. Uh, before I dive into this, um, first, I'm going to start a new GoFundMe campaign uh, so that I can attend the sentencing. Um, I want to thank once again, I don't know who you are, but those, I, I know some of you, but not everyone. Um, for those of you who contributed to my campaign to go to the trial, I want to thank you once again from the absolute core bottom of my heart. Um, that you felt that my motivation to support Brandon as a human being and to um, I'm not support his crimes, but to support him as a person, that you understood my mission and how important that was, maybe not just to me, but in the greater scheme of things. Um, I still have 80% of those funds. I ended up, unfortunately, having to drop um, a little bit of it into the rental car uh, that I got, um, but I do have some of that left, uh, the greater percentage of it. Um, I will need um, more funds in order to attend. So I will be setting up another campaign in the next day or two, probably tomorrow, um, to subsidize it's basically my travel and my lodging expenses. It's unbelievable how those add up. It's incredible. And I was even considering taking the train. Um, that, unfortunately, wouldn't provide me as much uh, like mobility in terms of, um, like, I don't have a cell phone. So if I took the train, I wouldn't be able to summon Uber Um well, I probably would be able to summon Uber from the train station, but then getting it back, uh, you know, there's not going to be any wireless at, um, on Oneida County Correctional Facility. So, so taking the train would be, it, it's actually just a, it's as expensive. It's like 200 bucks and renting a, tra renting a car, renting a train, renting a car would be, it, it was about $240 for a week. Um, and then the hotel, at least $100, maybe a little bit more. Um, it, it's just crazy. So, so that's where those, uh, if I raise funds, um, that's where it's going to be going to. 
And I just, again, wanted to thank those who contributed last time and to let you guys know where those funds are because I am accountable for them and I'm being accountable for them. Second, I wanted to mention that I have a Facebook group to discuss this case. Uh, I started it last month. It is called the Bianca Devins Case Analysis Group. Both Bianca's and Brandon's family members are in the group, so uh, please, please be mindful and be prudent when you post. Um, these are people who are coping with a huge amount of intense shit right now. Uh, I just please must ask you to be as respectful and considerate of their experience as possible. So, I've been receiving a like voluminous amount of mail from Brandon over the past two months, really, since like January. And um, a couple things I want to say. Um, He's in a major transition period right now. Uh, once he's sentenced, he may have a somewhat of a blackout period, so to speak, where um, before he is transferred to a what is kind of like a way station prison where he will be temporarily, uh, he cannot receive mail, he cannot receive phone calls, cannot make calls, cannot send out mail. I think because they just want to lock everything down um, before his transport. Um, so he's basically getting in as much mail as he can uh, before that time period. And this is a young man who has an immense amount to say. He is an extremely gifted writer. And I'm saying that from a professional standpoint. And not only does he express himself with, like, remarkable eloquence and f finesse, um, but what he has to say, that is where the meat of it really is. It's, I mean, you can have a writer who can write well put together sentences and knows their, their grammar and their syntax is on point and it can be as perfect as perfect can be but it can be as dry as all hell and i find that the most amazing thing about brandon's self-expression through his writing is that what he has to say is immensely personal and thought-provoking and super vulnerable it's not easy to make yourself vulnerable as a writer. It's, it's it, it takes practice, honestly. I mean, I've been writing my entire life. I've been writing professionally for 15 years. And it is something you have to learn how to do. It's about talking about the things that most scare you, talking about the things that cause you the most pain, writing about the things that you're passionate about. I mean, that that is easier, but there is a certain kind of vulnerability in that as well. Um, being self-reflective, reflecting on your life, reflecting, you know, thinking about where Brandon has been over the past year. Um, he writes consistently about how did he get to where he ended up. And I, I feel, you know, that's that's very vulnerable. Even if he was just writing to himself, not just anybody can do that. Um, he's incredibly candid and very revealing. Um, he's really, really, really good at conveying the experience of what it's like to be him, showing the world, I guess, through his writing um, or whatever, like who he is. Um, he writes a lot about self-doubt. He writes a, a great deal about his weaknesses, um, about his depression and his grief as a result of his actions. 
Um, but also just also in general, um, grief that he's had for, for a long time. Uh, this is an industrious, passionate, honest, and courageous young man. And I have to say that I am incredibly proud of him. I'm very proud of him for having the balls to make that guilty plea so that he can move on with his life. He has a life to live. Even if it's inside. He still has to find a way to live with himself. He has to forgive himself on some level. And he has, he has to process the trauma of what he's done. So the trauma that he basically created, unfortunately, for himself as an adult. And he also has to process the trauma from his childhood. And I'm telling you, he's doing this in spades. This is all he does. Every time he sends me a letter, and I've been getting letters twice a week, each one is like 20 pages long. And they are mind-blowing. They are publishable. They are beyond introspective. They're spiritual. They're filled with remorse, regret, intense grief, and sadness. And at the same time, they're filled with this amazing strength. I think about what it would be like to be a good, law-abiding human being for like your entire life, however that is, how long that is. For Brandon, it was 21 years. For others of us, maybe it's 40 something, 50 something. And then all of a sudden, something happens and this person that this, you know, kind of um, example that I'm giving does something heinous, something that is hurtful of life or and or removes life that severely impacts families that causes others grief. Can you imagine what that would be like? If suddenly one day your your life was totally normal, you were going to Dunkin Donuts to get your usual, you know, bagel and cream cheese and coffee. And then, you know, you stopped off at Target to, to pick up some, uh, I don't know, uh, you, need, you need your hair gel. And then, um, you know, then you, you're texting with your friends and on Snapchat or Instagram. And, you know, you talk to your mom or your dad. And then the next day, you're imprisoned for, for, for homicide. That's basically, in a nutshell, what what it was like for Brandon. That's a really frightening concept to me, personally. Like, it means that any one of us that doesn't identify ourselves as law-breaking, um, psychotic, having homicidal tendencies, like, there's no red flags or anything, right? It's like, it means that any one of us could potentially end up in a similar situation, and I know that this may sound super far-fetched to a lot of you. And you're like, dude, you're crazy. You are off your damn rocker. What the hell are you talking about? Um, it's not that black and white. Uh, I know that I'm not homicidal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because, you know, we want to separate the people who do these things from ourselves. But the thing is, they were part of us before. And we didn't recognize that they were capable of murder, right? So something that is different, different between like, um, say someone like, 
this is a distinction I want to make. Something that's different between, like, say, Bianca and Brandon is that Bianca was fortunate enough to have psychiatric care. She was able to see professionals and to to be diagnosed and to be hospitalized in an inpatient situation. Brandon never had that opportunity. It was not financially possible um, th- there was it was there was too much already going on with the foster care system and um, he never had a place to land. Uh, he had a place to call home every couple of months until he moved again. He was constantly on the move. And there just, there was no, I don't believe that any um, family members had insurance that he could be covered under. So, whatever mental health challenges he faced were invisible. Um, so I just, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, he and I have discussed often uh, a lot about how I, I didn't, and I just don't get this, this, this myth that Mental health is available to everybody, whether you're on the system or you're, you're paying for private insurance. And it's just a freaking lie. It's not true. Plus, like, there's so many aspects of mental health. It's not like, for some people, yeah, you can go to one therapist and they diagnose you with depression and you leave with some um, SSRIs or whatever. Uh, antidepressants and you take them for six months and then you might see that therapist every week you might see them twice a month who knows Um, and then at the end of six months you find guess what I feel so much better and then when you come off the meds you're actually fine that is like the best case scenario and the rarest Um, people when when we have mental health challenges they are so much more compounded and there's a lot more going on than say just depression or just anxiety um there may be a trauma history there may be sexual trauma history there may be substance abuse active substance abuse um and then it's like you then you can't ever really find one therapist that treats all of it you have to go to different therapists who are specialists in all these different things and each of these people costs money And the meds cost money. And if you're on the system, um, it really depends on what state and what city you live in uh, as to what they provide. But it's, they're not going to provide you with um, the cutting edge medications or cutting edge therapy. Um, They're going to do what they can for you under you know, with the limited resources that they have. So, you know, Brandon was in that camp. Um, He was unable to really attain mental health resources. I mean, it wasn't even in the cards. And um, who knows? I'm really curious if he had been diagnosed, um, what would would a a professional have found? What would have been there? So I just wanted to bring that up um, because, you know, I'm saying that, you know, one day Brandon was like, he was part of us with a capital U. You know, he was on this side. He was on our side. He was, he was a free man. He was someone who was allowed to um, go about life at his will and, um, was able to work a job, uh, own a car, rent an apartment, whatever. 
And the very next day, all of those freedoms were taken away because of the actions that he took on the morning of July 14th. And that's really freaking scary that your life can change that drastically that quickly. And I'm just saying that I kind of feel like in the news, I'm seeing it happen more and more. People are just losing their shit. And I think that boundary, um, especially if you haven't been diagnosed and you think you might have mental health issues, you don't know what lies on either side of that boundary, whether it's the good shit or the bad shit. Um, I, at least, I have a very comprehensive beyond comprehensive um, because I've been in therapy for decades I have a very comprehensive understanding of my diagnoses and I know um, where I am and uh, what I struggle with but can you imagine not knowing and knowing however on some level that you you definitely have mental health challenges but there's no way to know what they are and there is no way for you to treat them because you don't have the money. Uh, you don't have a job that provides benefits um, or whatever, whatever it is. So I just wanted to present that as something to think about. So now I will delve into the YouTube live chat responses from Brandon. I am not going to say, um, I'm not going to say who, he doesn't always say um, the name of the person who wrote the comment, but I'm not going to read any of them. I'm just going to read the comments. Okay, so here we go. He says, thank you for the YouTube chats. I'd like to address some of the comments that stood out to me. Quote, he wanted to ruin Bianca's family's life disgustingly untrue. I adored Bianca's family and I am sickened by how much I've hurt them. Quote, seven-year-old is a child plus young girl. So basically, we there's been a lot of discussion um, in both my, my lives and in the comments about was Bianca a child? Uh, she was a minor, but 17 in the New York is age of consent. Um, so that's basically what he's referring to. He says, this seems to be a common terminology for describing her. People ignore the fact that I am only four years older than her. And he also says, no one seems to ask why Bianca was into guys who were older. There's always this, it's always the reverse. She was interested in guys who were a couple years older. And, um, you know, that's never questioned. Um, quote, could you feel empathy for Ted Bundy? End quote. Brandon says, Ted Bundy was a serial killer. He liked killing people. He didn't call the cops on himself and certainly didn't condemn his own actions. I am nothing like Ted Bundy. Amen, brother. Um, completely, completely different situation. Quote, um, someone saying, I went through a lot too, but I want to help people. I never killed anyone. I would never want to hurt or kill anyone because of my traumatic childhood past. Uh, he said, ask anybody who knew me. That's what I did the other 21 years and six months of my life was help people. I didn't sit and wallow and hate the world. Quote, um, you, so this is something that they're saying basically to me. You seem to have sympathy for him, but not her. He knows that this isn't accurate, uh, not an accurate description of me, but he says, this is exactly what I don't want to have happen. Bianca was a victim long before I met her. 
She did fucked up things, but she also experienced them. And she's gone. She deserves much more sympathy than I. Quote, is he getting psychiatric help? End quote. Not one iota, he says. The penal system is about punishment, not redemption. Someone said, uh, quote, sounds like he'll try to use the insanity defense, end quote. He said, I never planned on an insanity defense. I've already seen a psychiatrist with my attorney. I'm not insane. So that was never in the cards. Nobody gets an insanity defense. That's like pre, like one, one, like 0.5% of any cases that try to, uh, present that N- nobody gets insanity. I mean, it's, it's, I was asking my therapist about that actually. And she was saying how part of the problem with that is that the, um, the DSM, what is it? Five now? Um, what I'm basically saying is that the psychiatric in the, the psychiatric community defines insanity as something completely different from how the judicial system defines it. And that whenever it, it becomes a point of interest or um, something that the defense is going to try and push, it's really, really hard because of that, because there's major discrepancy uh, between those two um, communities and they both see it completely differently and that's why it doesn't usually fly um, here's another quote from uh, the chat Brandon will paint himself in the best possible light end quote he said this one's the worst of all the comments what I did was sick wrong gruesome tragic and downright evil Bianca didn't deserve to die, and her family didn't deserve to lose her. I do not expect mercy, pity, empathy, or forgiveness, and have been amazed that I've received any at all. I could not care less whether I live, die, go home, or spend life in prison. But what I do care about is trying to prevent this from ever occurring again. And if we continue to ignore the traumas and the shit, the kind of shit that led me here, meaning his past... And again, what I meant, unchecked mental instability, mental health issues. He continues, tomorrow somebody else will lose their Bianca. And some kid like me will have to face the agony that I do daily, meaning grief and regret. And right now I'm in a position to do that, meaning to voice himself. How many well-known murderers have come out and said, what I did was unjustifiably wrong? How many have told the world that it isn't glorious or honorable in any way, shape, or form to kill a person? I'm going to do what I can to show people I'm not a psychopath, that my words have meaning, and if they hate me for it, so be it. I clearly never intended to paint myself nicely. Considering I attempted to I, considering I attempted suicide without leaving any explanation or justification for the en- events prior, and I'm clearly not attempting to score, quote, brownie points for trial, this is before the trial, because I'm pleading 25 to life. The truth will come out, and it will be ugly, but it can be used for good. And there's just one more thing I want to read for this. Um, someone had commented, quote, he wanted to cause chaos and get away with it, end quote, end quote. I love how, I, this is something also about Brandon. He, there is no fucking bullshit. There is no bullshit. He is super real and genuine, and he doesn't hold back. He's like, all right, this is just freaking stupid. He's like, I posted Bianca's full name and address on Discord. I called the police on myself. I severed my own jugular. How the fuck did I, quote, try to get away with it? Um, Someone else commented, after the murder, he kept insulting Bianca. And he said, I insulted Alex. I insulted her orbiters, but I never insulted her. Um, 
I'm addressing after the murder. Um, just so you know, I'm, 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 I wanted to make a point of that, that this person had said after the murder. So they're basically addressing uh, the Discord messages and um, said that Brandon was insulting Bianca and he's like, uh, no, actually, I was, I was insulting. What he basically says is that he, he, uh, he's very frustrated with the R9K community and feels that it's done a great deal of damage and that, uh, Bianca was definitely a victim of what went on there. And that, that is the entity that he was basically insulting through those Discord messages. Um, one last comment. Someone said, I don't believe he loved her. You don't kill the people you love. He said, this is extremely ignorant. ignorant. I question why I'm even bothering to address it. There is a reason why in murders... Spouses and family are always the first suspects. Love harbors emotions intense enough to facilitate murder, like when things go wrong. They say that you fight the most with those you love the most. Yeah, tell me about it. Indeed, the most dangerous people are those who can kill strangers with whom they share no emotion, which would be Ted Bundy. That's what serial killers are about. As you can see, um, you know, Brandon was rather incensed by the comments, and, and I don't blame him. I mean, I was incensed by those comments as well, some of them. A lot of times I feel like people come onto YouTube to just so they, they can say something that they feel they're super isolated, um, either just socially speaking or socially speaking and physically speaking and they don't have anywhere to be heard and that they just basically vomit their thoughts and feelings out without checking themselves like they're not they're not thinking about the other people in the chat they're not considering that there may be family in the chat they're just spewing shit they're just saying whatever comes to their mind and it it's very disrespectful and um you know it's like it's like when you act the, the saying you act on impulse someone who acts on impulse who is um who engages in very high risk behavior which i would say actually and again this is not this is not a judgment that that i would say that bianca would fall into that category um and i be, because i fall into that category myself um at certain periods of my life, for sure. Um, I understand it. I know what it's about. But it's, it's, that's kind of what those comments are like. Like, people are just saying stuff just because they can go on YouTube and say shit and, and be seen, so to speak. Um, but it's so obvious, you know, those comments are not really, some of them, I'm not saying all of the ones that he referred to, but some of them are just, they're very reactionary. They're very um, tied up in emotion. And they're, they're not really about Brandon. They're not about Bianca. And they're not about me. And um, I can understand why he, you know, was frustrated by some of them. Um, as, again, as was I. But I wanted to share those. And... Um, I mean, I think it's pretty amazing to be able to get his perspective on uh, something that happened on YouTube when, you know, he can't observe it for himself, but at least he can, he can see the commentary. I mean, it's about him. I kind of feel like um, he deserves to see what's being said. So, so that is, um, that is all I'm going to be um, saying in this podcast. I hope it was informative and interesting. 
Um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, as the weeks progress and the sentencing grows closer, I am going to be providing um, considerable coverage and uh, not just up until sentencing, but past sentencing. So I encourage you to subscribe uh, if you're interested in this case at all in any form. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, I look forward to your comments. Uh, always love to see what people have to say. So thank you again.